in Revelation chapter 17, we identified Babylon the Great, right, as the harlot and the religious system. One of the identifications was she wore purple and scarlet, right? What do we have here? Well, this is what we identified. You can see the, the harlot up there in the right-hand corner with her cup. And remember, in the cup, the Bible says, is the, the blood of the saints. In other words, this religious institution has um, murdered Christians all the way from its inception. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, Here's the, the harlot riding the seven-headed beast. You can see the Vatican in the background in the picture. And over here on the left, you see this glorious angel who lights up the sky. In Revelation 18.1, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the whole the uh, hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Okay, so what happened to Babylon? In verse 2 here, Babylon the great has fallen, and what did it become? The Bible says it, it has become the habitation of devils, and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Well, this actually doesn't say it all by itself, but it says enough there where you get the idea that there comes a point where God's got to give up completely on this religious institution because it's filled with the demonic beings. After years and years and years of, of denial of the word and going and, and uh, producing their, their Babylonian priesthood and such and uh, making the whole world drunk of their wine, the, uh, the scripture says. But this also, this idea of this every unclean and hateful bird and every foul spirit, it ties in with some other teachings that Jesus did. Does anybody read, remember this one? You see the, the guy standing next to a mustard tree is what that is. And there's a planting of the mustard seed. And this comes out of the gospel. And he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? In other words, Jesus is saying, what I'm going to tell you right now represents the kingdom of God. He says, what comparison shall we compare? It's like a grain of mustard seed. Now, in some of the other parables, when he talks about the seed, he, he identifies, he said, the seed is the word of God, right? He's talking about the kingdom of God, and he says it starts out as a, like a mustard seed, similar to a mustard seed. But we know that he said the seed represents the word of God. So it starts out a small seed which gets planted, which is the seed of the word of God or the gospel. And when it is sown in the earth, it is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But look what happened. It turns into this great tree, and that is kind of abnormal. This tree here is... It's, a, it's what happens in the wild, okay, if it's not, uh, if it's not really being harvested for, to be a mustard to, to plant. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs. Now, herbs are usually considered small. This became a great tree. And so it's something that's really uh, strange and abnormal. When it is sown, it grows up, becomes greater than all the herbs. It shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the sh uh, shadow of it. And you can see, the, if you look closely at those, those birds, those fowls, what do they look like, you know? Okay, they're not buzzards. They're actually something else. They're supposed to represent some type of demonic dragon or de demonic being. Because, remember, we just got through reading about how Babylon the Great has been filled with every foul and hateful bird. In the other parables, when the, when the, um, uh, in the parable about the sower sows the word... 
the, the fowl comes out and steals the seed on the ground. And Jesus said the bird or the fowl represents Satan himself. So this is the demonic beings we just read in uh, the uh, Babylon the Great here. And, and we read it in this parable. What happens is Jesus is saying the gospel will be kind of compared like this. It'll go out like a seed, just like it's supposed to. And it will be planted. And it will grow, but it will grow abnormally. And it will shoot out great branches. And then it, it will invite all these foul spirits, demonic spirits, to come and lodge on its branches. That's how, what he, how he talks about false Christianity, false Christian system, which we have called in the Bible, Babylon the Great. Okay, does everybody make that connection? Then he says something about another parable. He said in Matthew 33 here, and this is from the NIV, and anybody know what the NIV stands for? Not inspired version. The not inspired version. Yeah. Nearly inspired. Anyway, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed. And notice I've got these colored, these words colored. It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Okay? Sounds kind of simple, right? So here, so let me read it again. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took, mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now, we're going to have a little lesson here on the NIV versus the Bible. The NIV versus the truth. And we have in the past done extensive teaching on what they're doing to our Bible. But this is a perfect opportunity to bring this out. And uh, it also, the kingdom of heaven, we saw in the last, the last parable, the kingdom of heaven represents, you know, it goes out as a seed. It, it becomes this great, enormous, abnormal church, right? And all these birds come into it. It's defiled. It becomes corrupt because of the false prophet and the false teaching. But we're going to see that here as well. Okay, so let's compare the King James Version. Let's go to the King James. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. And in the meantime, did you see that uh, now we, it, it kind of looked like sesame seeds, but actually what that's supposed to represent is corruption has set in. What does KJV stand for? The truth. Ha! <laughs> I gotcha! It's the true Bible. What I want to show you is the difference between the translation because... Some Bibles try to, their point is, they're not trying to give you a translation so much or, or, to, or to stick something in there to sway your thinking. They're trying to give you a word-for-word -word translation. King James is great because you can go to like a Strong's Concordance. Pastor, I'm sure you've done it. Many people have done it. You can look at, you can take the word, it has a number. You go to the Strong Concordance and you can see what Greek word it was or what Hebrew word it was. And it always goes one-to-one. -one. But see, NIV doesn't do that. They add different words, and we're going to see that. But anyway, King James says it like this. He says, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, it sounds pretty much the same, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. See, we, uh, and a lot of times, you don't realize how bad it is until you actually compare them. Look at this. So, in the NIV up there, he says, He told him still another parable, The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. King James says, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid, and three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. 
So, in NIV says, it's like yeast. The Bible says it's like unto leaven. Now, let me, to make this very clear to you, the word yeast never appears in the Old Testament or New Testament. If in, in your Bible, if you ever read the word yeast, you got the wrong Bible. They took that because they say it's equivalent to leaven in the English language. But we're not interested in their thoughts. We want to know what Jesus said. It goes back to the Garden of Eden again. Remember when Satan came to Eve to tempt her? He said, has God said... And then he went on to tempt her, that thou shalt you know, not eat of every tree of the garden. He didn't say yeast, he said leaven. Let's look at the next one. Then he said the woman took and mixed. Well, the Bible actually says took and hid. And you can mix something or you can hide it. And that can be, I mean, you can hide it by mixing it. But mixing does not mean hide. And you see how they're steering you away from what the Bible actually says. Then it says in the NIV about 60 pounds of flour. The Bible says three measures of meal. Now in all fairness, a measure is approximately 20 pounds. So if you have three measures, it's about 60 pounds. So it's not that they're lying to you there. However... That's not, Jesus didn't say about 60 pounds. Some theologian said that. Some translator said that. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said three measures of meal. I believe every word of God is important. If, now, do you think Jesus could have said about 60 pounds? Sure he could have. We want to be able to go back. The word 60 never appears in the scripture. Three does. You see? Three does. Now, I would allow for them to say three measures and have a footnote and say about 60 pounds. That would be fair. But don't take the word of God out and stick 60 pounds. Because then I don't know what Jesus said. And then the NIV says, until it worked all through the dough. And the King James says, till the whole was leaven. And what's really uh, something to, to pick up on here, the King James uses the word leaven here, which up there they use yeast, and down here he uses leaven again. This is exactly what he said. Leaven and leaven. Here they say yeast and they don't even say leaven. Or yeast. I mean, to be consistent, they should have at least said yeast, right? You can see... How, that, yes? What's leaven? We're going to show that right now. If we don't satisfy it, my wife will, will try to correct us here. The word leaven, which we see here, it actually, in the Greek... Because, you know, it's in the Greek, right? The, the, your gospel, the, your, uh, usually they go to the Greek, the New Testament. The Greek word is zume. Okay? And you can see the first meaning of the word, the Greek word, is leaven. Does it say anywhere in the dictionary for that word that it means yeast? No. Somebody took it upon himself to make it say yeast. But that's not what the word said. And then there's a second definition. It said metamorphically. It means inveterate mental and moral corruption. And it, so it says inveterate mental and moral corruption. Which means all the time it always means mental and moral corruption if it's being used as a meta metaphor and it's also viewed in its tendency to infect others so what it means is this is something 
that is infectious? This is what Jesus is trying to get across when he uses the term leaven. That it represents some type of mortal putrefaction. Some metamorphosis occurred. And it's infectious, like an infectious disease. You know what an infectious disease is? If you don't, you know, you don't send your kids to school if you know that there's an infectious disease going around because they're going to bring it home, right? So it's better off to keep them home. Or if you have an infectious disease, don't send them to church so that everybody gets to the infectious disease. Keep them home, right? But those are the meanings. And we can even take that to its equivalent in the Hebrew. This Hebrew word which is the, the, uh, the, it also means leaven, is pronounced seor. And seor sounds pretty similar to what? Sour. In English we say sour. In Hebrew we say seor. Because it is, the, the word means sourdough. It's sourdough leavened or fermented. Now, did you want to add something? Yes. Okay. Sourdough or, or friendship cake is made to rise by the fermentation of the dough. That's why you put it in, put some more flour, wrap it up, and it'll, it'll make the entire thing rise. If you put yeast, and I don't care how much flour you put it in, if you don't add the correct ingredients, you're not going to get a chemical reaction because it is not souring or fermenting. It's just making a gas that causes it to rise and eat sugar. And it's not the same thing as leaven. Right. It never was. It never has never been. Never has been. It's my N horse. No. And, 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 no. And, and a hobby horse is good because it, it, it really, when, you, when you're looking at the words, what did Jesus say, it's important. They had a festival before Passover called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you'll, well, I'm going to bring this up. Uh, was it last week we had the Passover Seder? And they had the four glasses of wine. And he went over how they would take a little, like a little brush and a little pan to go through the house and to get all, and he even said yeast. He did. He said, what is leaven? It's yeast. It's not. Now, I'm going to be fair to him in this, in this way. The Jews today teach it was yeast, just like the church is teaching that it's yeast. And they, they don't even understand their own custom and, and here's, here's the key principle. Yeast is something that exists and you basically can't get rid of it. Yeast is all over the world. Yeast is normal. You have grapes growing on a tree, there's yeast on top of them. And this is why when you, when you make wine, you don't even have to throw yeast in there. You can take the grapes, the yeast is on the outside of the grapes. They stamp the grapes and make wine, and the yeast is already in there. And before long, it will ferment eventually. Now, if you buy ye, if you buy grapes at the store and you wash it, you know, you get all the yeast off, and that's not going to happen, right? Because you've gotten it all off. But I'm saying naturally, you cannot get rid of the yeast. Now, here's where it's important: the the feast of unleavened bread. They spent seven. They were to spend seven days to get the yeast out. Out of their house. In that environment, it was a total impossibility. Now, if you worked at Motorola and you saw how I used to work there, and it was really cool. Errol and probably has, has, I'm sure he's seen it. Where they, they've got these, uh, or they, they used to have these in the environment where it was so pure, so filtered. I mean, there was nothing in it. Was the, 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 they were able to filter the air so perfectly because they had to do that because of the, uh, the, the transistors and whatever, they, the electronics that they were in. They had to have the clean air, uncontaminated. But back then, it was impossible. You didn't have that type of system to put that around. You, didn't, you, you, you couldn't make a, the house like a bubble boy. And, make, and cleanse all the yeast. But God's word, the commandment actually said, 
He, whoever does not get all the leaven out of their house is cut off from the people. In other words, God would have put an absolute impossibility upon the people if he told them to get all the yeast out of their house. What he said, get all the leaven out of their house, because the leaven, they could go through the cabinets, they could say, oh, here's a little piece. And the, the truth of the matter is, you would make the, the loaf, and take, take a piece of the dough, and you would save it for the next one. And, and, and like, like our, our friend said, uh, the, uh, the Jewish minister last week, he said what they would do during the, cu- during the festival of Passover, or the, 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 um, the fest, Feast of Unleavened Bread, is they would give it to the O'Briens. Remember, he said the O'Briens, because the O'Briens will eat anything, right? In actuality, there was a certain priest who was, who was uh, selected that he would keep all the leaven, so he would keep all of it for the housewives because after the feast was over, they had to go get yeah. some more. They had to go get some more. Or they wouldn't be able to make bread. So he would keep it all for everybody who's over. Okay. So, you know, he what was, was keeping it so they could come get it back. Right, right. So you're saying a priest kept all the leaven that was taken out so that they could give it back. Because actually, they needed, they did need leaven for future, there's some of the feasts had bread that had leaven. Not all of it was unleavened bread. Some did have leaven in some of the festivals. Now, the word mixed, and the NIV says mixed, but the, the King James says, I say, the, the, the Bible says hid, not mixed. And the word in the Greek is a group dough, which I will underline, here it means hid up in the NIV. They say it, it, they're translated as mix. But you see the number one definition of a group dough was to conceal something. Now if you really, if you, if you had a precious gold coin and you didn't want your husband to know. So you were going to hide it, Right? Now, would you, would you hi- deliberately hide it, or would you just mix it with something? Maybe mix it with some quarters. No, you're purposely hide. The word means hide, not mix. You see that? Now, the second, the second uh, meaning of it, to mingle one thing with another, but it's two... With the, with the main purpose to hide, to, do, to conceal. And that's exactly what Jesus said. He said it was like unto leaven, and the woman took and hid it, right? Also, the, uh, the word in Hebrew was tama, and it means hide, conceal, to cover an object for the purpose of not making something known. So you can see the concealing again. So once again, you can see how off the NIV is, right? Then we had the 60 pounds. But do you see way, right up here, there's actually two words. One is trace and one is satan. And that's what they translated as 60 pounds. Now, you don't have to know Greek to know what the word trace means. Does the word trace mean 60? What do you think it means? Three. Three. We get that from the, the famous song, Uno, dos, tres, right? So, actually, it's one, two, three, cuatro, so I didn't even get that right. But anyway, trace means three, and then the other word. So, so, here, you see how much more accurate we want to know what did Jesus said. He said three. In Greek, it was trace, okay? And the word measure was soton. Now, I'm not going to, I don't want to make a big issue of this, but here, the letter, the word soton here, soton, what you read in Hebrew, soton, is the same as, in Greek, as satanos, meaning Satan. I don't, I'm not saying that he, Jesus is saying three, three Satans. But, to say the word, it almost, it's, uh, what do you call it when two words sound the same? Homonym. 
Well, they have that in Hebrew also. And, and sometimes they do that deliberately. Okay? So he may have been using this deliberately, a play on words here, to because remember, the woman, see you down there in the corner, she represents Babylon the Great, the false spirit of religion who's hiding, concealing this uh, leaven, which is corruption and putrefaction, she's hi deliberately hiding and concealing that in three measures. And the word sounds very similar to Satan. Three Satans. Three compartments of Satan. It just so happens we call, call her Babylon the Great. What do you think the three compartments of Satan would be? The three measures. How about Nimrod? Semiramis, Tammuz. It kind of works. Now, I don't want to get off too far on this. I'm just saying it's, uh, it's possible, right, that Jesus intended that. But we can't say literally he said that, but it sure does sound, Satan sounds a lot like Satan. And then the last one was, uh, we pointed out, it, it, the NIV said it worked all through the dough. The King James says the whole was leaven. Again, we come back to the word leaven. And nowhere does it say it worked all through the dough. It was leavened. That's what the word is. That's what the word he said, the leaven. Jesus didn't say and it worked all through the dough. The translator is providing you, whoever this theologian is that was appointed to do the translation, he, he's giving you his thoughts. Now, do you, when you read the Bible, do you want Jesus' thoughts or his thoughts? It's okay to have his thoughts in a footnote. But don't take the word of God out and stick his thoughts in. In fact, doesn't the Bible somewhere, someone tell me where, it says, don't add or what? Change. Don't add or take away or change the word of God. Because if you do, I'm going to add the curses and, and the punishment. and It's in the back of the book, right? Did you know three times in the Bible it says don't add or change, take away from his word? It says it in the beginning of the Bible, in the middle of the Bible, and at the end of the Bible. That goes on a lot today. Oh, oh, man. Oh, man. You should have been here for the when we talked about it. We talked about it. We showed for two hours. We compared the translations. It was just uh, crazy. What language was prominently used in the day when Jesus was teaching? You know, because it's Gospels. This comes from the Gospel, right? Jesus was teaching. Was he, do you think he, he was teaching the Jewish people? He wasn't teaching the Greeks. He was teaching the Jewish people who spoke one of... Uh, now, in business, they, they would have spoke Greek, those who were in business. But the average person would have spoke one of two languages, Aramaic. Hebrew or Aramaic, right? Now, here's something interesting. Because a common language in that, in that time period was Aramaic. And there has been the eastern part of the church, the eastern world, the eastern part of the church, says that they have the original untampered writings just the way Jesus said it in Aramaic. And, and they will tell you, when you study it, that the Gospels, at least Matthew and Mark, maybe not Luke or John, but at least Matthew or Mark, for sure were either in Hebrew or Aramaic. In fact, you read it and it says... It, sometimes it tell, it, Jesus says an Aramaic word. It puts it right in Aramaic, right? He said, and by, by uh, interpretation, it means, remember when he, he said, I say to you, Tabitha, arise? Or he said it, it was uh, Aramaic. But anyway, the Aramaic word for, uh, for leaven, in other words, the exact word Jesus probably said was probably not zume, in Greek, but he probably said chimera, which was the word leaven in Aramaic. 
and you can go directly to the Aramaic Bible. I pulled this right out of the that right I pulled that right out of the Aramaic Bible. That's the way Camara looks. Now, how many have heard of uh, the in Latin Camara or uh, in the Greek Camara? We have that beast there. Have you heard of that beast? The beast. The reason it was called a Camara, the mythology behind it. It was a beast made up of many different types of DNA, or many different, uh, many different parts. Different parts. See, it had a head of a lion, a head of a serpent, a head of a goat, and it breathed fire. And that was in the in the myths. But the word was chimera. There's a whole study. Um, there's um, when you study where languages came from, how word, where did words come from. The, the, the study is etymology. I believe that's how we pronounce it. Etymology. And that is, where did the words originate from? You know, you can go to the English dictionary, and a lot of times you look up the word, and it says this comes from the Latin, or this comes from the Greek, or this comes from German, right? Well, there's a lot. Uh, there in, in, uh, there's also in one area of uh, etymology, it's called Edenics. Because it's based upon the belief that the original language, remember in the Tower, the Tower of Babel, everybody spoke the same language. The belief is, is that it, it um, was originally some form of one of the ancient Semitic languages. It could have been Hebrew, it could have been Aramaic, it could have even been Arabic, because all those are... Uh, uh, Semitic languages. But probably the truth of it is there was one original and it split into those. It divided into those. So this word would have come way before Latin or Greek chimera. From the, and it meant leaven. And here it's consisted of many parts when it came to Greek. The Greeks the Greeks used it, and of course it went from Greek to Latin to represent this beast. But among other things, uh, we have a definition coming up here. So here's a chimera, and you don't really have to pay much attention to the, the picture on the beast. It's not in the Bible, that, that beast. I just wanted to, you know, if you, if you had any uh, recollection or any association with that in, in Greek. But... Um, Here's the definition of chimera. And the, the fourth one is, is real interesting because remember, what we're saying is this word, this is the Greek word chimera, or the English word chimera actually, um, which came, they say come from the Greek, but the Greek actually came from the Aramaic. And we said it represented leaven. Now look at here. Uh, chimera, the dictionary says in Greek mythology, is a fire-breathing monster with the head of a lion, a body of a goat, the tail of a serpent. We got that. Uh, a fabulous beast made up of parts taken from various animals. So different parts, right? Okay. A wild and unrealistic dream or notion. But the fourth one, in biology, a, a chimera is an organism especially a cultivated plant consisting of at least two genetically different kinds of tissue as a result of mutation or grafting. What happens in leaven, when, when, you, have, when you have this flour and it becomes leaven, you can't unleaven it anymore. In fact, everything it touches is leavens, Right? It's, it's something new. It consists of two things. And something new that wasn't there before. There was two parts. It was added. And that really is the emphasis here of leaven. That's never the, the emphasis of yeast. Let me give you another for instance uh, or another thing about um, getting yeast out of your house. If the Bible was saying get yeast out of your house and whoever part participated of yeast would be cut off from their people. How could you drink the wine? Wine was fermented by yeast. So you could get all the yeast out of your uh, house and out of your kitchen and you have un, un yeast bread, but you got yeast inside the wine and you would have been cut off because it's considered a corruption, right? I, and I think that the reason this is here 
Remember the great sin of the angels in the time of Noah? What did they do? They produced something new that was not normal. Angels and humans had relations and produced giant offspring. And for that, for that primary reason, they were put in prison in Tartarus. It says in the book of, I think it's, is it Peter? It's either Peter or Jude, one to two. Maybe both of them say it. But they were held in prison till this day because that was the, one of the greatest no, 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 no. And you're not, there's certain things you're not supposed to, all the way through the Old Testament, God says, don't combine this with this. Don't combine this. God doesn't like the combining thing. He likes more of a separating thing. I'm going to tell you, if you take, pastor, you're a pastor of a denomination. You may not call it a denomination. A movement. But anyway, I'm not trying to be, uh, so you're a pastor of a movement. And what is the main thing that describes that movement? Different. It's, Pente- it's a Pentecostal, right? It's Pentecostal, but not. That, that's, that's, that's what separates us from right. the denominations. I mean, there's other things. There's other th- but I'm trying to use this as an illustration. So, Church of God, Pentecostal. Now, You have down the street, I imagine, I'm not sure, but I imagine down the street you have a Baptist church somewhere. I will guarantee if you take a Baptist and you combine them with a Pentecostal, you're not going to have a Pentecostal anymore and you're not going to have a Baptist anymore. You're going to have a Bapticostal. And that's the truth. And you know what? You can go to that Bapticostal, they can go to that Pentecostal church years and years and years, but some of those Baptist concepts, they believe them. And they may differ slightly to the Pentecostal because it's a Baptist, right? But at the same time, so if they go to the Pentecostal church, they can fit in because they are Pentecostal, but they're slightly Baptist. But they can go to the Baptist church too because as long as they don't speak in tongues, no one will ever know. That right? Well, I know it happens because we got a Baptist Pentecostal right here. I'm not a Baptist I'm plenty lost. Oh, you're plenty lost. Anyway, there's nothing wrong with having Baptists over here and Pentecostals over, right? There's nothing wrong with that because we see different perspectives. Now, let's throw in... Now, did you see something with uh, the changing of the, this whole fermentation, what's happening here? Now, on the illustration, I would recommend if you ever have a biscuit or a piece of bread and it begins to look like this. Now, it's gone. It's gone from the part of fresh to putrefied to I better not even touch that. (laughs) I shouldn't even be looking at it. (laughs) Right? I mean, things can get so bad that you don't want... (laughs) Remember we talked about infectious? You don't even want to go near it. And I don't know if you can make it out, but those are actually bugs. Some kind of, what they are, are like uh, microscopic mites. And, you know, God is such a big God. Did you ever ever realize that microscopic mites and microscopic creatures actually exist and they are just, they look just like bugs? They have digestive systems. I've always wondered, do the mites have mites? Some creatures have intestinal parasites, right? And the intestinal parasite has an intestinal system or digestive system. Do they have parasites that are microscopic to them? And if they do, do that, those other ones? And how far does God's creation go in either direction? I don't know. That's the glory of God. But anyway, 
You can see here, one translation up the top here, the New Living uh, Translation, here's part of it. It permeated every part of the dough, and that's what this is supposed to represent. But really, that translation up there is not so valid. But here, uh, the Murdoch translation from 1851, the Peshetta. The Peshetta is the Aramaic, comes from the Aramaic uh, manuscripts. And here Jesus says, another similitude spake he to them, the kingdom of heaven is like the leaven, right? Once again, leaven which a woman took and buried... She buried it to hide it in three measures of meal until the whole was fermented. And that's what happens when the leaven, when you add the leaven, it, it, actually the whole ends up becoming fermented. Then you have Jesus answering questions about this whole leaven thing. And you notice here, I don't have to read the whole thing, but in Matthew chapter 16, 6, in verse 6 and in verse 12, we're going to look at, Jesus said in verse 6, he said, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he went through this whole illustration to teach us that leaven has to do, the practical part of his teaching here, of the leaven has to do with the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now, what was the Sadducees and what were the Pharisees? Anybody know? Is that just uh, Mutt and Jeff? One didn't believe in the crucifixion and one didn't believe in the resurrection. Okay, so, and, and you're right, but what I was getting at was they were religious leaders. Now, they, they varied in opinion, but they were religious teachers. And, and G these are the ones that Jesus got really angry with. Because they, they knew, they, they refused to teach the truth. Even when it was pointed out to them, they refused to teach the truth. We are confronted today with a kind of Christianity that has become so polluted. From a, from a purely biblical word perspective. Because it's been taught, it's been pointed out to them, and they refuse to acknowledge that they're in error. It's infiltrated every denomination, it's infiltrated every Bible school, every seminary, everywhere you go, it's infiltrated. All these, the newer translate, the, uh, the use of leaven, in, or the use of yeast instead of the use of leaven, where it's, it's perfectly obvious when you actually look at it, there's no denial that what he said was leaven, right? But they do this repeatedly. They keep transforming. They keep changing your word. And Jesus said, take heed and beware of your religious leaders because they have leaven. Remember, the leaven was a corruption. It's almost like a, a poison when it gets down to it, right? It's, it's, it's uh, putrefied. It's, it's uh, what? If you think of it as a rotten apple in the, in the, in the middle of the barrel of good apples, mm -hmm. you'll rot the entire thing. That's the way it is. Absolutely. That's, that's a great illustration. So you have an apple, and the apple is rotten, and it's in the middle of the basket of apples. What's going to happen to all the apples? Anybody, so you, you go down to, the, you go to your grocery store, and you come home with apples. The first thing you do is you take the rotten one out and throw it in the trash. You don't say, well, I'm just going to leave it there for a week. Till I get to it. Right? You wouldn't do that. Because it's going to putrefy or, or ruin the others. And that's what he's saying. Take heed and beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And then in verse 12, Then the apostles understood how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of Pharisees and of Sadducees. In other words, the religious leaders. He said, beware of their teaching. Beware of their doctrine. Because it's like leaven. And it, it will purposely steal. And it will putrefy. It will corrupt the true doctrine that he's taught. The true words of God. Now all of this, remember the seed of the mustard seed was planted. It became this tree. The, the demonic fowl came and rested in its branches. That represents 
The world church. When I say world church, I'm not talking about those people who are really close to God. I'm talking about the people that think they are. But they have no word in their life. Those are religious leaders and those are the ones that are teaching the, this false doctrine. And that's what he's talking about here. And what do we call them in the book of Revelation? Babylon the great. Right? The harlot. And I heard another voice from heaven. Because here's Babylon the great. The harlot who represents the false religious system. The false teaching She's got a cup in her hand. Normally, when you have the cup like that in the hand, what do you, what do you got in there normally? I know, I know we talked about the blood. Wine. wine. And wine is fermented. Right? Wine is fermented. So she's got a, she, if you look at her, you can see she's got a fermented cup in her hand. And... He says, she's a religious, she's the leader of all this religious system. He, he says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Now, if you are a member of that particular group, are you in or out of them? You're in them, Right? Now, you might be one of his people. See, come out of her, my people. In other words, if you're one of my people and you are in her, come out. Now, is that a commandment or a suggestion? It's a, it's a, it's a commandment, isn't it? In fact, nowhere did I ever hear about that Moses brought the ten suggestions. Right? Right? And every word of God. Jesus said we live by every word that comes out of the word of God. Right? So every word is a commandment. Really. Every word is a commandment. People, I, I hear people say all the time, they say, well, the church isn't under the commandments anymore. Do you have a New Testament? The New Testament is it's the word of God. And if the word of God, if you got the word New Testament, you got just as much law in the New Testament as you got in the Old Testament. It's just that you have, you're saved by grace. Right? So come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. So let's say you're not a member of that denomination. You just use their Bible. Let's say... Here's a perfect example. Jehovah Witness got their own Bible. I don't know if you know. Their Bible is wrong. Mormons have their own Bible. The Mormons have their own Bible. Catholics have their own Bible. The Catholics have their own Bible. So, if you are in the church but you're using that Bible that's been corrupt by their teachers, are you in or out? You're still in. If you're partaking of the things that they... F for instance, let's say... Let's say you were raised to believe in uh, going to confessional. Right? I was. I was raised that way. You couldn't take, you couldn't take uh, um, the Eucharist communion unless you went to confession. That's how I was. Anybody else? Who was? Okay, so we got a lot. Of, we've got a lot of people that were. Now, what if I start going to a church that doesn't believe that? Pastor, every Saturday I call you up. We're having communion this week. You say, "Oh no, we're gonna have it next week." Oh, can I do conf can I do confession? Sure. And pastor's like, well, "Good, I get to find out what he did." <laughs> Where he buried the treasure. Yeah. Okay, so so that the, and that almost seems ridiculous because if I really wanted to talk to the pastor about some sin I was struggling with, and we all struggle, right? right. Well, so maybe that's not that great of an illustration. Let's put it like this: What if I, what if I light candles to saints and I pray to the saints, but now I come out of that, now I'm coming to church here, but I still light the candles at home and I pray to the saints. Am I in or out? You're in. I'm still in. I'm a, what if I had a statue of Mary in my yard 
But now, I come out, but I still have that statue of Mary. I'm still in. You see, I, you still have things holding you. you have, and and what, ha, G, what Jesus wants you to be is free. Anything that connects you with Babylon, he wants you to let go of, right? Any, can anybody else think of some other examples of this? One of the biggest ones I think that's a stumbling block to people is believing that you have to be forgiven by somebody here on earth or else you're not forgiven by God. Okay. Believing that someone here on earth can actually make a difference. And that's a good one. And that really does come from where? Catholicism, doesn't it? And really, not even, because it comes from Babylon. They're the ones that came up with it. You do not have to have somebody forgive you for you to be forgiven except for God alone, right? You pray to God. He's the one who died for you, right? Someone can help lead you into that. Someone can encourage you. Someone can, can you can speak, you can communicate with them. You, he, and, uh, and they can say, Okay, well, you know you've been forgiven for that. You've already asked forgiveness. You know you've been forgiven. Here's what we do. A lot of times we have trouble with sin, and we keep beating our head against the wall. We've asked Jesus to forgive us a hundred times. And we keep beating our head against the wall. I, I knew a girl, let me give you an example. I knew a girl that had an abortion. And... She kept asking God to forgive her over and over. She wasn't, she wasn't continually having abortions. She had one. But she was so haunted by guilt. It was, and that's one of the consequences of having gone through that is the guilt associated with it. Because she she came to terms with that she that 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 was a baby and and she killed him for whatever reason. Now I'm not, I'm just saying she struggled with it over and over. I actually had a conversation with. Her. I told her. I said, "Did you ask God for forgiveness?" Yes, I did. Then He forgave you. When you asked, did you believe that He forgave you? Yes. Then let go of it. And that actually is a real good illustration because here's what Satan does. Satan loves to get us trapped in guilt. Because if he can get you trapped in guilt, you'll never feel good about yourself. And you'll always go through life thinking, God can never love me. Look what a nasty creature I am. Now Paul is a perfect illustration. Apostle Paul, he said... He, I mean, he, he, he used himself as an illustration on the things that he did. How many people have had Christians stoned and killed? He did. Yet we say he was one of the great... He, God had him right... Uh, what is it? Uh, two-thirds of the New Testament? God must have forgiven 